This is Guns and Butter. There's something happening, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it is ain't exactly clear. There's a man with a gun over there. Because our assets far exceed our debt, we will be forced in bankruptcy to pay our debt in full, 100 cents on the dollar. You know, when companies or individuals have a lot of debt and a small amount of assets, uh, the creditors have to take a small, they have to take like 10 cents on the dollar or 20 cents on the dollar, whatever is agreed in bankruptcy. But that's not the case when your assets exceed your debt. When your assets exceed your debt, you have to pay all of your debt. So there's no benefit. Uh, Bankruptcy will not decrease our debt. In fact, the expense of bankruptcy itself is very high. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. Today on Guns and Butter, Grace Aaron. Today's show, What Way Forward for Pacifica. Grace Aaron currently serves on the Los Angeles KPFK Local Station Board and the Pacifica Foundation National Board. She served on the Los Angeles KPFK Local Station Board from 2003 to 2009 and on the Pacifica National Board in 2008 and 2009. She was the chair of the Pacifica National Board in 2009 and the interim executive director of the Pacifica Foundation in that year. She is a longtime peace and anti-nuclear activist and currently is on the board of the Los Angeles branch of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. She has been an active organizer for peace action for many years. Today we discuss the financial crisis at the Pacifica Radio Network, options going forward, and possible long-term solutions. Grace Aaron, welcome. Well, I'm glad to be on your show, Bonnie. The Pacifica Foundation owns the licenses for five radio stations, KDFK in Los Angeles, WPFW in Washington, D.C., KPFT in Houston, WBAI in New York City, and KPFA in Berkeley. The Empire State Building in New York City hosts the transmitter for WBAI, Pacifica's New York station. Why did the Empire State Realty Trust soothe Pacifica And how did the loss of this lawsuit lead to the present financial crisis at Pacifica? What happened was, is it okay if I give a little history about this? Absolutely. That's what I'd like you to do. Uh, Yeah, let me explain. Um, when, When the Twin Towers were destroyed in 2001, WBAI was being transmitted atop the Empire State Building. That's where our transmitter was. However... The rest of the towers for radio, or a lot of the towers for radio and TV broadcasting, were on the top of the Twin Towers, which was the highest point in New York City. Uh, The reason for that is the buildings block a lot of the radio signals, so in order to have good reception, you have to be at the highest point amidst the skyscrapers. So we had a lease atop the Empire State Building, which became very valuable because now it was the only game in town. Our lease expired in 2005. At that time, uh, Ambrose Lane, who was for a very brief period the interim executive director and I believe the chair of the National Board of Pacifica, signed a 15-year contract with the Empire State Building, which the Empire State Building at that time basically had a monopoly on tower space. So we signed this lease. Uh, he signed it for the Pacifica Foundation. It was, I, I imagine, I don't know for sure, but I imagine it was uh, approved by the Pacifica National Board. That had nothing to do with the management of WBAI itself. The Board of Pacifica signed that 15-year contract. I think the 15-year contract started off at a, a reasonable monthly rate for a license and uh, rent on the Empire State Building for the transmitter. And then, but there were escalator clauses and penalties and all kinds of things. So right now, the rent is up to, I think, about $60,000 a month, which is incredibly a, a huge burden on WBAI. Now, since the uh, there are other sites now in New York because the World Trade Center has been built and there are towers on top of the World Trade Center and there's another place called Four Times Square. But anyway, 
uh, now the rates are lower for renting space uh, for your tower transmitter in New York City. So the normal rate now, if we didn't have this contract, would be between 12000 a month and 17000 a month in rent. So we are still bound by the contract we have with them for another three years until I believe it's June of 2020 at a, at a high rate, about 60000 a month, and I think it's increasing. What happened was WBAI was no longer able to pay the rent, so there was a handshake agreement with the original owner of the Empire State Building between Bertold Reimers and uh, the head uh, at that time. And uh, the agreement was to pay 12000 a month, but it was just a verbal agreement that that would be accepted. So for a while that was accepted. What happened was, and nobody actually worked out, uh, uh, got that, written down and agreed to legally on paper. And, you know, that really wasn't the fault of WBAI because that kind of agreement cannot be made locally by the WBAI general manager or anyone locally at that station because Pacifica owns WBAI. And so it would have to have been done by a senior management person and the national board of Pacifica to iron that out, and that was not done. So it was a failure of the National Management and National Board of Pacifica, not particularly of WBAI itself. So anyway, um, what happened was, a number of years ago, the Empire State Building was sold, and it was bought by a very large uh, real estate investment trust called the Empire State Realty Trust. They owe a huge amount of real estate uh, in the New York area tens of billions of dollars worth of real estate. It's a huge, huge publicly traded corporation. So we have this contract and we became uh, behind on those monthly payments. So we were so far behind that the Empire State of Realty Trust got a summary judgment against us. We didn't sue them. They sued us for payment because they know that we have a lot of assets and we could eventually pay them if we had to. So they got this judgment a number of months ago and uh, we have been trying to figure out how to pay them. We also are accumulating more debt to them because every month we still have the rent of about 60000 a month and uh, we have not been paying it in full every month as we should be or as we're obligated to in that contract. Does that answer the question? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things. So the Empire State Realty Trust sued Pacifica for the original contract amount, which was an escalating uh, amount, and at this point it was $60,000. Now, on the on the verbal handshake agreement with WBAI to accept $12,000 per month, was that agreement um that was that verbal agreement for twelve thousand a month is that all they were going to accept, or were they simply deferring the rest of it? You know it's not clear what that agreement was. It was assumed to be that well, we'll iron it out and uh we'll work at a payment plan for the remainder or um we'll rewrite the contract uh, It's not clear what that verbal handshake shake agreement was. I see. But it's true that Empire State at that time was accepting 12000 a month. They weren't trying to sue us at that time. But after that, we uh, got more and more behind. So it accumulated. And uh, when Empire State Realty Trust uh, started trying to get the judgment, it was at $1.8 million. Now it's more than that because at the time they got the judgment, judgment it was i don't know six or eight months ago and now uh, we're still further behind in our payment right so how much was the summary judgment against pacifica and how much in total does pacifica owe the empire state realty trust i also understand that the debt to esrt also includes interest and penalties is that right yes so we owe them, the summary judgment is for 1.839 and change, 
$839,000 and change, plus attorney's fees. We're not sure how much the attorney's fees are going to wind up being. We haven't gotten that information yet. And Pacific is also accruing interest and penalties on this, this amount of money, right? Yes, and Empire State is charging us 9% on the arrears. So we're paying interest on that money that we owe them, plus penalties. And we are in arrears another, I would say, between four and 500000 since that summary judgment. However, if we pay the summary judgment, if we pay it in full, uh, Empire State will not be able to attach our assets, which is the dilemma we're facing now. I see. So what is Pacifica's total debt to all creditors? Could you break this down for us? Um, I don't have an exact number. Um, the CFO, Chief Financial Officer of Pacifica, pegs it at about $8 million currently. I think it might be a little less than that, but let's leave the figure at $8 million, and I'm only going to give you rough figures, not exact figures. I'd say we owe the Empire State Realty Trust, as of today, probably about $2.5 million. That's the summary judgment, plus the legal fees, plus whatever we've accrued in uh, unpaid rent since the summary judgment. So I'd say it's about $2.5 million. I believe we owe Amy Goodman about $2.5 million, but she's not pressing us for that money. Then we owe 750000 or so in uh, back pension plan payments. And then we owe other sundry debts to old lawyers we never paid and uh, real, their real estate taxes that we owe on the KPFA building and on the building next to it that we own that houses the national office. And so there are uh, a, a, a bunch of other bills that we've never paid that uh, are part of our total debt. I see. So in a, a ballpark figure, you're saying about $8 million. Yes. Might be a little less than that. Oh, okay. So uh, that's... I don't have the exact figure. That's probably tops. Okay. Well, so then what are Pacifica's total assets? The total assets, the real estate was appraised this year, and all of the real estate totals about between 10 and $11 million in value. That's the buildings that ha house the KPFA building, the KPFK building, the KPFT building in Houston, and that extra building that houses the national office that's right next to the KPFA building. So that's a total of four buildings, and uh, as I said, they're worth between 10 and $11 million in total. So that's the real estate assets. And I just wanted to point out that um, there are two storefronts next to the KPFA radio station, but actually those two storefronts, that constitutes one building. Is that, isn't that right? Uh, yes. I, I'm, you know, I haven't been there in a long time, so I believe it may have two entrances. It may kind of be two buildings it has two street addresses but i think it's uh 1921 martin luther king way and 1925 but it's considered one building okay so in real estate assets you're saying maybe that the pacifica owns a ballpark 10 to 11 million dollars now what are the other assets for instance the signals the signals are extremely valuable. In fact, somebody uh, a week or so ago sent me a very interesting uh, piece of information from Variety magazine. It was in an article from May 9th, 2017. I'll just read this little blurb. Emma's Communication has sold popular Los Angeles hip-hop radio station KPWR Power 106 to the Merguello Group for $82.75 million pending FCC and other regulatory approvals. That's an amazing amount of money for uh, a Los Angeles radio station, $82.75 million. That's a recent sale of a signal. So we have very, very valuable signals 
they're not all of the same value. The WBAI signal is maybe the most valuable one because it's in the number one media mecca of the United States, the largest uh, population area. And, of course, New York City is very influential. I believe the WBAI signal, if it were sold outright, would be worth about $48 million. That's what we've been told. I'm not sure of the value of the KPFK signal, which is very valuable, the KPFA signal, or the KPFT signal, or the uh, Washington, D.C. signal, which I, I believe Washington, D.C., that signal is worth about $14 million if sold outright. I'm speaking with Pacifica National Director Grace Aaron. Today's show, What Way Forward for Pacifica? I'm Bonnie Faulkner. This is Guns and Butter. So in addition to the signals, which are worth a lot, multiple, multiple million dollars, and the real estate, what are Pacifica's other assets? I mean, obviously, there's the Pacifica Audio Port with all the, the programming. I mean, there. what other assets does Pacifica have? Um, I think that's about it in terms of tangible assets. Well, the tangible assets would be the real estate. I don't think that the archives, which are extremely important, um, but I don't think that they are very sellable. In other words, I don't think we could auction the archives Mm -hmm. and raise money, a significant amount of money from the archives. I don't know for sure, but most of the archives need to be digitized. So in the state that they're in, old uh, tape recordings, basically, that are not digitized for the most part, um, in that state, they probably are not sellable. So the main assets are the signals themselves and the real estate. There may be a few other things. I mean, there there are probably towers and uh, transmitters and things like that. I really don't have an idea of what their value would be, but Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it would be as significant as either the signals or the real estate. So then is it safe to say that Pacifica's assets far outweigh its debts? Absolutely. That's the, the danger at the moment, we have a $2 million debt, and we have probably $150 million in assets. So we simply have to pay that debt. And if we can't pay it out of our operating uh, revenue, we're going to have to pay it by selling an asset. And that's the conundrum, because uh, the stations don't want to have their assets sold. In New York, uh, people who love WBAI don't want to have their radio station either degraded by a swap. There's a thing called a signal swap. So sometimes you can um, sell a signal for a partly cash payment and also another signal of lesser value. So there's talk about a signal swap so that we could generate enough money to pay our debt and still have a radio station, but it wouldn't be as good a signal as the one we have now in New York. Well, in your research, what have you discovered about the option of a signal swap for the New York station? What is this option, and what would it solve, and how viable is it? Well, the problem with the signal swap is we have our bylaws, and our bylaws state that in order to sell or swap a signal, there must be a membership vote that approves that. And we have about 55,000 members. So a mailing would have to be sent out to the membership asking if they would approve a signal swap or sale. But before that even, you know, the national board would have to agree on a very specific signal swap because we're not talking about a generalized notion of a signal swap. There has to be an offer. It has to be investigated. Uh, The board would have to agree that it's a good idea and vote to... Uh, sell or swap a signal. And so after the board decides and after there's due diligence on the part of the the uh, seller and buyer, which takes time, then there would have to be a vote of the membership, and then it goes for FCC approval. The FCC approval process is a time-consuming process. Uh, it's 90 days at the very least, and there's a 30-day Uh, public comment period. And in that public comment period, if there are objections, that could very much lengthen the time for the FCC approval process. So 
a signal swap or sale, if there's significant objection, could take uh, two years, three years, who knows? There's no way to tell how lengthy that process would be. It certainly would never be a short process. There's a concept that possibly in bankruptcy it would be made easier. But bankruptcy will not affect the FCC part of the process. So even if uh, some say that in bankruptcy we don't have to have a membership vote, I don't know if that's true. That's uh, a supposition that some people have who favor bankruptcy. I do not favor bankruptcy. But uh, that's an idea that's been floated that we could get around having to do a membership vote. But in bankruptcy, there's no way to get out of the FCC process. And that can be very lengthy. What did you find out when you looked into the FM signals presently in New York City? Well, I found out that I, I looked up the all the FM signals in the New York metropolitan area, and I believe there are only 17 or so. That's not very many signals. It's not like you sell a house in a market where there are hundreds and hundreds of houses for sale, and so you can... Uh, you can sell or buy a house fairly easily. There's not a lot of inventory when it comes to signals. So uh, the choice of a signal sale or swap, you might want to sell a radio signal. There might not be any buyers. Or uh, I think that selling a radio signal might be easier than trying to swap it because there aren't that many signals available in any one geographical area that are eligible to be swapped. So... It's a, a kind of a tricky process. There's no guarantee that a good offer will come around or that uh, that uh, there will be any offers at all. Exactly. So it's so it's, in the details with a lot of the, these things. Yeah, it sounds to me like uh, this is no simple solution at all. It's not simple. It's very complicated. And people like to make it, oh, we'll just sell the WBAI signal and all our problems will be solved because, look, it's so valuable. Uh, I don't think we, this foundation, in my opinion, does not need money. It needs income. We need to improve the, the uh, programming at our radio stations so that we have more listeners and so that we have more impact on the world around us. I am a peace activist. Uh, I've been a longtime peace activist. And Pacifica, we need to, to really explain why more peaceful resolution of conflict on a global level and a better stewardship of the environment and better human rights and uh, better civil liberties is the way to go as species. And this is what Pacifica to me is all about. And it's very important. And having the stations just have an infusion of money to hobble along in the condition that they're currently in, I don't think is the way to go. We need to get more income, and the way that that will happen is by having really engaging, important, vital programming that explains a lot of things and that the the uh, population in these signal areas want to hear and find important and enlightening and inspiring. That's what Pacific is all about. It's not about uh, just uh, having a, a big bank account that you can uh, run through. Uh, to me, it's, it's important to keep this vital resource alive and vital. Can I uh, segue a little bit and, and, and mention something which I forgot to mention in the beginning? Yes. In uh, uh, an open session of the Pacifica National Board, a public session, on January 4th, a resolution was adopted. It states, all managers, employees, and board members of Pacifica must state clearly that any comments they make to media, including Pacifica programs, about the current Pacifica situation regarding the Empire State Realty Trust summary judgment are not made in their official capacity, but only as their personal opinion. Official statements can only be made after they are approved by the Pacifica National Board. So I'm not speaking as uh, a national board member. 
although I am a national board member, and I'm not speaking for the board or for the management of Pacifica. I'm giving you my personal opinion. I think that that's kind of understood, but I wanted to make it clear. Now, after the summary judgment uh, with the ESRT, and this is, we're talking on January 16th, where does the situation rest presently? Technically, are Pacifica assets presently at risk? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the Empire State Realty Trust has moved forward and is now capable of attaching our assets at, at all of our signal areas. So they can put liens on all of our properties if they haven't already. And uh, they can take money directly out of our bank accounts at this point. So what I am hearing is that there are two ways to deal with the current financial crisis at Pacifica. Either take out loans to pay the judgment against Pacifica to ESRT or declare bankruptcy. Let's start with the loan option. What did the Pacifica National Board vote to do about this summary judgment? Um, the Pacifica National Board, I'll just read you the report out from the closed session, the executive session of the Pacifica National Board on January 2nd. The board approved the terms for two loans. The smaller one will be offered to Empire State Realty Trust to show good faith and will only be funded if Empire State Realty Trust agrees to give us more time before seizing any of our assets. And the larger one will be used to pay off the smaller bridge loan as well as the balance owed to Empire State Realty Trust if they agree to forbear. The proceeds from this loan would also be used to pay some other Pacifica debt. Loan repayment planning shall be a priority. Now, there was a little change uh, in what's happening since this motion passed, since this, this happened, and that is that we don't believe Empire State will give us any more time. They want the payment in full. So the loan that we're looking at would be for full payment of the entire summary judgment, which would make it impossible if it's paid for Empire State to seize any of our assets. They would have to go back to the court and get another summary judgment. So because they're, they're charging us 9% interest on the money we owe them, it seems logical to me that we would take out a loan at the same interest rate or even a little higher, a little lower, to pay off Empire State. At least our assets wouldn't be seized. Now, the... The loan expense is the same whether we take a loan or we do nothing because it's basically a loan. We are, owe money to Empire State, and they can charge us interest on that money, 9%, which is a pretty high rate of interest. Well, what can you reveal publicly about the two loans that are presently in the works? And... Could you also explain how taking out loans to pay off the judgment against Pacifica is not creating additional debt? Yeah, it, we owe money. So uh, some of the money we owe is accruing interest for the people we owe, owe it to. We're, we're going to have to pay interest on the money. That's particularly true of the Empire State Realty Trust, the debt we have to them. Um I can't give you details about the loans. Uh, I believe there's been public information uh, in emails, uh, uh, and I think that there's a friendly loan. Uh, p people here down at KPFK got together and decided to loan Pacifica money. These are people who are not super wealthy. They do have money in retirement accounts, and they're willing to take the risk of loaning it to Pacifica at um, an interest rate. So they would get some return for their investment. The loans would be uh, using Pacifica real estate as, as uh, collateral. In this case, the KPFK building. And they're in process. There's another loan that would uh, probably have better terms, but that won't be available to us for a couple of months, more or less. So we need something more quickly because we're at great risk of Empire State. The, the greatest risk we have right now is that Empire State 
taps into our bank accounts, making the stations not able to operate. They can easily put liens on our buildings, but it would take them quite a while to foreclose on our real estate and force us to sell the real estate. But the bank accounts could be basically just tapped into and money extracted from them, which would make it impossible for the radio stations to pay their bills, pay their staff. So that is a serious situation that's facing us. I'm speaking with Pacifica National Director Grace Aaron. Today's show, What Way Forward for Pacifica? I'm Bonnie Faulkner. This is Guns and Butter. So the Empire State Realty Trust has had this ability to tap into Pacifica's bank account since when? Since January 8th? And it's now it's the 16th? Yes. And they haven't done anything so far? No, they haven't. I think they are they are aware that we're seriously considering, this is just speculation on my part, but I believe that they know that we're really trying to uh, find a loan and pay them. I don't think they're, they're willing to put anything in writing saying that they won't uh, uh, seize our assets or that they'll give us more time, but that seems to be what's happening. But there's no guarantee of that. I don't know. They could at any moment start taking money from our bank accounts. Now, with regard to the two loans, there's a smaller one and a larger one. And then the larger loan would be available like within a few months from now, and that would pay off the earlier smaller one. Is that right? Yes. And how would the loans be secured? So at this point, we have to face the fact that in the short term, we're going to have to sell assets or mortgage assets to pay the Empire State Realty Trust. And actually, to pay the uh, payments going forward for the length of the rest of the, that contract. So, now you're saying that these these loans that are in the works, they would be secured by, I believe you said, Pacifica Real Estate, specifically the KPFK building, is that correct? Well, uh Yes, the first loan, I believe, would be secured by the KPFK building. The second loan, by uh, more than one piece of property. Have any of the uh, Pacifica properties been put up for sale yet? Yes. The property in Berkeley that houses some of the national office staff has been put on the market recently. So that's the loan option, I guess, that the National Board has voted for. What about the the bankruptcy option? What are the pluses and minuses of declaring the network bankrupt? Let's start with the positives. What are those? Well, the positives of bankruptcy would be that we would have much more time or some more time to pay off our debt while still maintaining our, our, our operations. So um, that's the main plus. It would not decrease our debt at all. Or if it did decrease the debt, it would be a very small amount. Because our assets far exceed our debt, we will be forced in bankruptcy to pay our debt in full, 100 cents on the dollar. You know, when companies or individuals have a lot of debt and a small amount of assets, uh, the creditors have to take a small, they have to take like 10 cents on the dollar or 20 cents on the dollar, whatever is agreed in bankruptcy. But that's not the case when your assets exceed your debt. When your assets exceed your debt, you have to pay all of your debt. So there's no benefit. Uh, Bankruptcy will not decrease our debt. In fact, the expense of bankruptcy itself is very high. Uh, Two lawyers, one lawyer estimated that the cost of bankruptcy for Pacifica would be between $500,000 and $1 million, and the other one said uh, $750,000 to $1 million at least. And these two lawyers, I don't think, have an understanding of how complicated Pacifica is as a nonprofit and politically There are so many different dynamics going on with Pacifica that I'm sure that that will negatively impact the bankruptcy process and have it cost more than that one million figure. And that one million figure, 
um, adds to our debt. It doesn't do anything. So we, we, we might have uh, time to stretch out payment of the debt, but we'll still have to pay all of it. And that's the other downside of bankruptcy. We will be pressured, we will be forced in bankruptcy to pay all of our debt, all $8 million or so. If we're not in bankruptcy, we don't have to pay all of that debt. Some of that debt could, could go on for a very long time without the uh, creditor pushing us. And that's mainly Amy Goodman. I don't think that she would force us into bankruptcy to pay her the $2.5 million that we owe her. But in bankruptcy, we would be forced to by the court. So that's a, a big downside of bankruptcy. So the upside is just that it would take the pressure off for a short period of time, and we would have time to figure out how to pay the debt. But we can figure that out without going into bankruptcy, which is extremely expensive. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make the best decision. There are no good options. There's no secret magic bullet or cure or pill that we have right now. We have to sell or mortgage assets in order to pay debt in part or in full and then figure out how to improve our income so that we're able to carry the debt moving forward. So there are costs associated with bankruptcy. Now, what all does bankruptcy entail? This is a very complex process. What is a committee of creditors? Well, a committee of creditors is the significant creditors, the people that we owe money to. They form a committee. And the foundation has 120 days, maybe it's 180 days, to come up with a plan to figure out how to continue the operations of the network and also how to pay off the creditors, a payment plan, essentially, for the creditors. Now, if the committee of creditors rejects the plan or the judge rejects the plan, then the committee of creditors can kind of force us into a course of action that we might not like. Now, I personally think it's very doubtful that the committee of creditors will put up with um, a signal sale or swap option that could take literally years to complete. They will probably force the sale of real estate. And if we have to pay all of our debt, see, this is the trick here. If we have to pay all of our debt and the, and the court, that's the option that's forced on us by the, the creditors because they want their money more quickly, then we would lose virtually all of our real estate because it will take all of our real estate to pay $8 million in debt plus the cost of bankruptcy itself. So that brings it up to $9 million or so at least. And the assets, the real estate assets we own are worth between 10 and $11 million. So you do the math and you find out that probably every building that Pacifica owns, including the KPFA uh, studio, will have to be sold in bankruptcy. I mean, maybe there's a way to get around that, but I don't know of one. We've consulted with bankruptcy attorneys, and I don't see a way out from that. The only way would be if the creditors are willing to wait for a signal sale or swap. And in the case of a signal sale or swap, who knows what the, um, if there's a trustee, if the board becomes very dysfunctional or it's decided that there's some gross malfeasance, which there really isn't uh, in Pacifica and the Pacifica board uh, operations currently, a trustee could be appointed. Who's to say that the trustee would decide that the signal to be sold would be the WBAI signal? Maybe that's not a good business decision. Maybe there would be a better signal swap offer for KPFA or KPFK, or KPFT, or WPFW. So if it's a strict business decision, if it makes more business sense to swap out or sell the KPFA signal to pay off the debt, that could happen in bankruptcy because we lose control. So I think it's better if the Pacifica community comes together, takes out a loan. I'm not saying that the signal swap or sale option is off the table. So we need the time to work it out. We need the time to figure out which direction we want to go in. 
do we want to mortgage real estate? Do we want to sell real estate? Do we want to take out some loans to give us some time to figure out what other assets to sell or how to fix the network? I think that the East Coast stations can be improved so that we're not that far away from viability. It's just that we need uh, an increase in income, basically, which means we need to run these stations better. And don't forget, in June, I believe, of 2020, our uh, contract with the Empire State Realty Trust will be over, and we will uh, be able to rent tower space at a much reduced monthly amount. So this is not a forever thing. This expense will not last forever. I'm speaking with Pacifica National Director Grace Aaron. Today's show, What Way Forward for Pacifica? I'm Bonnie Faulkner. This is Guns and Butter. The other thing is, in bankruptcy, our finance staff, our efforts will be geared to what the creditors want to know in terms of financial information about the network. Now, we are behind in our financial reporting to federal and state institutions. We still haven't completed our 2016 audit. We should be doing our 2017 audit. And instead of that, it seems that efforts by our national finance staff have been going into bankruptcy preparation, which is putting our nonprofit status at risk because the deadline, the extended deadline for the completion of the 2016 audit, fiscal audit, is February 14th, 2016, and that audit has barely been started. It's a very complicated process, and uh, I, I'm fearful if we can't get another extension that, uh, you know, our nonprofit status is in jeopardy. So if we go into bankruptcy, uh, how are we going to fix that? We're going to have to find money somewhere to hire extra staff. Now, how will we get that money? Well, we'll either have to sell an asset very quickly to pay for the cost of bankruptcy, or we're going to have to take out loans. Now, in bankruptcy, the the interest rates are very high, much higher than uh, interest rates uh, we could get from taking a loan out outside of bankruptcy, before bankruptcy, or to prevent bankruptcy. So that's another concern. It is, it is possible to get loans if you're in bankruptcy, but we had uh, a friend did some research about this, and this is from a company called Quick Liquidity in Baton Rouge, Florida, and they said, per our conversation as an estimate for a debtor in possession loan, that's what these kinds of loans are called, on a property in Los Angeles as a first first mortgage, I believe the all-in cost will be 12 to 16%. That's a very high interest rate. Another um, debtor in possession lender, there aren't that many of them. These are lenders that lend to companies in bankruptcy. Another one in Sacramento, California called Blackburn and Sons Realty Capital Corporation says... Again, the rates on something like this would be in the range of 12.9% to 13.9% or so. Our loan would have to be in the first position on the property. So these are all loans that are collateralized by buildings. In other words, if we don't pay, we lose the building. It gives the right of the lender to foreclose on the property that's being used as collateral. So... In bankruptcy, we don't have the cash to pay for the very expensive accountants that the creditors are going to demand that we hire to get our books in order. And we will have to either rapidly sell an asset, and the only asset that we can sell rapidly would be real estate, or we will have to take out loans in bankruptcy based on real estate that we own. And those loans will have an extremely high interest rate if we have to take out more than one loan. So I don't think that that's a good option. Plus, diverting away from getting our financial reporting in order is causing us to uh, have a very poor credit rating, and we're in jeopardy of losing our uh, Corporation for Public Broadcast funding once again. 
And that's one of the reasons we're in the situation we're in, because past senior management and past boards of Pacifica have failed to ensure that our financial reporting uh, is done in a timely manner. So because of that, we've lost over three and a half million dollars of Corporation for Public Broadcast funding. If it weren't for that, if we had had that funding, we wouldn't be in the situation. We would have been able to pay the Empire State Building, even if we didn't want to. Well, we don't have a choice. We have the contract. But we would have been able to afford it because we'd have that Corporation for Public Broadcast funding, and we wouldn't have gotten this far in arrears. Pacifica lost the Corporation for Public Broadcasting funding because they didn't have the audits done in time. Is that correct? Correct. And not having the audits done in time has also jeopardized the Pacifica nonprofit status. Is that right? Yes, yes. There's a lot of talk blaming WBAI for the financial situation we're in. But WBAI is one of five stations. It's the responsibility of the national board and all of the stations and national management to get financial reporting done because we are one foundation. The Pacifica Foundation owns all of the stations and all of the properties. So the KPFK building is not owned by KPFK. It's owned by Pacifica. The KPFA building is not owned by KPFA. It's owned by Pacifica. Pacifica Foundation owns all the signals and all the real estate. And no one station lost us our CPB funding. The National Board is composed of representatives from all five stations, plus two affiliate representatives. So if the National Board did not ensure the timely preparation of audits of our books and lost because of that, because of that negligence or oversight, lost three and a half million dollars of Corporation for Public Broadcast funding, then, you know, there's enough blame to go around. We shouldn't be targeting one station. It's the responsibility of all of Pacifica to make sure that our financial house is in order. Well, are there any other big unknowns about declaring bankruptcy? This is a very... Um unpredictable process isn't it very unpredictable very unpredictable there are all kinds of theories there are a lot there's a lot of bankruptcy there are a lot of bankruptcy statutes so um a lot can happen who knows it's kind of russian roulette because these are federally appointed judges it's federal the bankruptcy courts are uh, federal uh the other um very dangerous thing is we're granted our radio signals by the Federal Communication Commission. I don't, I don't think it's often that the FCC pulls a license. But this is the Trump administration. Who knows what could happen? Do we really want to let the FCC know or have the FCC have the impression that we are not good stewards of these licenses? They are very, very, very valuable. It's our obligation to make sure that they're managed well, that these are public airwaves. If we seem to be too dysfunctional, there's a possibility that the FCC could take our licenses and give them to somebody they think or some nonprofit they think would be a better steward of one or more licenses. So I think it's very dangerous to not deal with this process in a rational way. I mean, we have huge amounts of assets. To me, a $2 million loan to pay off a debt or a $2 million debt is minuscule when you look at our $150 million in assets, $10 million or $11 million in real estate alone. I mean, it's silly to say that taking a $2 million loan on $11 million in property is crazy. It's not crazy. If it were crazy, everybody in the country who owns a home and has a mortgage would be considered to be crazy. We were very lucky to have been given this real estate by donors in the past. Very lucky. It's a wonderful legacy 
that we have, and we should be taking good care of it. I am not in favor of selling any real estate if we can hold on to it, although that building next to the KPFA building houses only about four or five staff. It is the most logical asset that we have to sell, and that could go a long way to paying the Empire State Realty Trust. So uh, maybe a combination of a loan along with the sale of that building would uh, be the way to go. What about the hire of a new executive director for Pacifica? What is happening with this? Because of some very good work by the personnel committee and uh, the board, uh, we found a really excellent interim executive director. I think he's going to just be terrific. We really need turnaround management, and this person fits the bill. I can't give any more details about it because the board voted to hire him, but it, the announcement is pending uh, the signing of a contract and a uh, background check. I think the background check has been completed, so that's fine. And uh, this person has just exactly the experience we need, a turnaround person who has a lot of experience with radio and public media. It's just a kind of a... a a real find to find this person. So I am uh, feeling very optimistic. He should be starting in a week or so. Well, what about a long-term solution for Pacifica National and the management in general at the foundation? Now, couldn't there be a lot of improvement there? Absolutely. I think, personally, my opinion is that the reason we're in this fix is because over a period of 10 or 12 years, there have been cuts in senior management of Pacifica. And I think that that's been a big mistake. We need to reverse what we've done. You know, what we've been doing hasn't worked, hasn't been working for us. Over a period of 10 or 12 years, there's been a slow, steady decline in listenership and membership and in revenue across all the five stations, the whole foundation. And... Part of the reason for that, in my opinion, is that the national office was diminished over time. Less and less authority was given to the national office, less and less money, the staff was cut. Now, it's just to me crazy to have an organization, a nonprofit, with over 150 staff members and have no strong executive director. That doesn't make any sense. And with an organization this size, especially with our history of very destructive human relation uh, lawsuits, we can't go with a weak national office with no human relations personnel or very little in terms of a human relations staff. You can't have 150 employees and not have human relations human relations director it's kind of not not logical in my viewpoint to have a national organization this size and this importance not have a national development director also we need a national programming director because on the local level the program directors are too much influenced by the local programmers who uh really put so much pressure. Anytime there is any effort to improve the programming, uh, there's a lot of backlash on the part of the programmers who besiege the general manager and the program director. So um, we need somebody external to the stations to monitor the programming and to ensure that it's improved. So over, over 10 or 12 years, instead of improving and enhancing national management, it's been basically decimated. I mean, we now have currently an interim executive director who's unpaid. He's been doing a job. He's a wonderful man, and he his heart is with Pacifica, of course, but he is unpaid. That doesn't make any sense to me. Before this, we have a, a history of this recently. This does not make any sense. And during these 10 years, there was no pressure on the part of uh, these interim executive directors to make sure that the books got done, 
to make sure that there was no theft on the local level, to make sure that our audits got completed. Nobody was paying attention to that because they didn't have time to do it. How much can you do as a senior executive of an organization this size if you're only doing it part-time as an unpaid person? It doesn't make any sense. So you don't amputate the head. You know, you don't leave a body like this headless. So first we need to make sure that we have better management in this organization and uh, put in standard business practices. I think that staff deserve to be evaluated on a regular basis. And there needs to be personnel files so that if we decide to remove someone or demote someone, it's justified. Uh, millions of dollars have been paid out by Pacifica for lawsuits based on wrongful termination, sexual harassment, all those kinds of things. So where we haven't paid senior management, we've wound up paying on the other end in terms of having to hire lawyers to uh, deal with the lawsuits and also to pay out settlements. These decisions to decrease the budgets for senior management have not panned out for us. They've been very expensive in the long run. Well, Grace, Aaron, thank you very much. And thank you for all your incredible work on behalf of Pacifica. Well, you're very welcome. And uh, thank you also for producing really scintillating programming. There's something happening here. Yeah, yeah. What it is ain't exactly I've been speaking with Grace Aaron. Today's show has been What Way Forward for Pacifica. Grace Aaron currently serves on the Los Angeles KPFK Local Station Board and the Pacifica Foundation National Board. She served on the Los Angeles KPFK Local Station Board from 2003 to 2009 and on the Pacifica National Board in 2008 and 2009. She was the chair of the Pacifica National Board in 2009 and the interim executive director of the Pacifica Foundation in that year. She is a longtime peace and anti-nuclear activist and currently is on the board of the Los Angeles branch of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. She has been an active organizer for Peace Action for many years. She can be contacted at graceerin at gmail.com. The Pacifica Foundation website is pacifica.org. Guns and Butter is produced by Bonnie Faulkner, Yaramako, and Tony Rango. Visit us at gunsandbutter.org to listen to past programs, comment on shows, or join our email list to receive our newsletter that includes recent shows and updates. Email us at faulkner at gunsandbutter.org. Follow us on Twitter at G&B Radio.